good morning and uh, thank you for joining us today. That video nicely summarized what the last year has been all about in the Alliance and Daimler partnership, getting down to work. As you know, our annual update has become a fixture of the Paris and Frankfurt Motor Shows over the last past several years. In previous year, we've told you about our latest projects and plans and how our capabilities have expanded. Today, as the corporation enters its seventh year, we like to think of it as a child who has matured, whose skills and capabilities today far exceed our hopes and expectation at its birth. We are at a fascinating time, a new era in which three forces, electrification, autonomous drive and connectivity are starting to change our industry. I expect we'll see more change in uh, this industry in the next five years than we have seen probably in the past 20. And those changes will bring tremendous opportunities. We're not afraid of them. We're looking forward to them. For those companies with the skills and foresight to save them. In order to save those opportunities, collaboration, like the one we have, will become increasingly necessary. No automaker can do it alone anymore in such a competitive, rapidly changing, high-tech environment. This partnership has, in fact, become a strategic pillar of both groups, a significant member of our blended automotive family. Indeed, uh, Dieter and I feel like proud fathers, or mothers, if you want, I take the father part. <laughs> <laughs> I challenge you on this one. So why are we working together? Because the benefits continue to increase, accelerating our time to market for key vehicle launches, reducing our investment and development costs, spurring our team to innovate and propose new ideas with new opportunities. For our customers, it means we can deliver high quality cars and trucks with more value with more innovative features at competitive prices. It's based on a spirit of cooperation and trust that has only grown stronger over the years. And the results have clearly benefited Renault, Nissan, and Daimler. This has become one of the most productive collaboration in our industry. More projects are on the drawing board, but today we want to update you on the progress we are making on those underway during the past year. So to get started on that, I'd like to hand over the stage to Dieter, who made some news yesterday regarding the smart lineup. Thank you, Carlos, and bienvenue from me as well. Uh, I only can agree, Carlos, our partnership has continuously grown over the last seven years. And as mentioned yesterday, there was another event which uh, delivered three proof points for that statement, our all electric Smart 4.2, Cabrio, and 4.4. For us, the Twingo Smart Project has always been an important and special one within our partnership, as the city cars were the first alliance um, project which was built on a common platform between the alliance and Daimler. Um, by equipping smart models with electric uh, drive trains, we are taking the next logical step for this project. Um, we really have a tremendous opportunity here as obviously the Lions has very strong expertise since a long time with um, electrification of vehicles altogether and with electric motors specifically. So the new motors for Smart uh, are built at the Renault plant in Cléon. Um, at the same time, obviously, uh, the experience we're having with batteries uh, in comments, starting with cells and continuing with batteries there, uh, which are used for our Mercedes vehicles as well, uh, is very profound. So the batteries for these new smart vehicles are coming from our plant in Cummins. This way, uh, we were able to become the only s brand with smart uh, to deliver and offer to the customers the entire portfolio with electric uh, drivetrains as well and at the same time to offer the only electric convertible at all. The market introduction of the smart EVs will start at the end of this year. And with this, I would like to hand back to Carlos. Thanks, Dieter. As the global EV leader with more than 350,000 
electric vehicles sold globally, the Alliance is certainly pleased to see the rising interest and competition in zero emission vehicles. Just yesterday, in the compact segment, Renault introduced a new extended range Zoe that will double its real autonomy of the current model. And as we see the charging infrastructure expand in many countries, we are nearing the turning point where range anxiety will, not, will no longer be the issue, but maybe one concern. Speaking of compact cars, it was just a year ago this month that we broke ground on our joint plant at Aguascalientes, Mexico. And as you may have noticed on the video, the buildings are up and nearing completion. That means we are getting closer to the start of production of the first of our next generation of premium compact cars and crossovers for infinity by late 2017. Then in 2018, Mercedes will begin producing an equally impressive lineup of new vehicles on the, new, on the same assembly line. This $1 billion plant is our biggest project, both in terms of potential volume and in the number of derivatives we will be building off a common architecture. The plant will be able to produce more than 230,000 vehicles a year by 2020. And we will use a unique new system to ensure the highest level of quality, a system that borrows the best practices from both Daimler and the Alliance. We've already hired 600 of the 3,000 foreseen employees who will eventually work at the plant, and that number is expected to rise to 1,000 by year's end. In addition, we aim to have at least 20% female workforce at the plant as part of our ongoing diversity initiative. Diversity is one of the keys to the success of the Alliance. It encourages different thinking and new ideas. And in terms of diversity of our product lineup, I'll now hand it over to Dieter again to update you on another significant co-development project in a new market segment for Mercedes. Thanks, Carlos. That's true. With our city cars, we've proven that we can co-develop and still sustain unmistakably unique brand identities. Now we're about to prove this once again. But instead of flyweights, we'll now shift to heavyweights. I'm talking about pickups, obviously. One and a half years ago, we announced we would enter the mid-size pickup segment. Nissan has over 80 years of experience developing and producing pickup trucks. In our partnership, we are building on this knowledge and expertise. So for us, it's the perfect opportunity for a sustainable portfolio extension. We'll achieve scale effects by leveraging Nissan's production capacities to the benefit of our, all of us. We'll massively speed up our market entry to our core markets in Australia and South Africa, in Latin America and in Europe. And meanwhile, we still build a true Mercedes engineered and designed by Daimler. And the timing is perfect. The mid-size pickup segment is not only booming, it's at the beginning of a major transformation. More and more customers are looking for pickup trucks with car-like specifications. And we will be driving force of this change. This way, we will close one of the last remaining gaps in our product portfolio. In addition to a unique exterior and interior design, the pickup will have all of the Mercedes distinctive attributes in terms of comfort design and connectivity. The joint work on the project is fully on track and the setup of facilities is forging ahead. In the coming weeks, we'll have even more news when we reveal our Mercedes-Benz pickup concept, so stay tuned. Speaking of joint production, let me add a quick update on our engine plant in Deckard, Tennessee. Since its start in mid-2014, we've already produced a quarter of a million high-quality engines for Nissan and Daimler there. And we are now in the midst of expanding the plant to further strengthen our global production network. All of these projects exemplify the value of our pragmatic partnership from the exchange of components to the development of engines and platforms all the way to our first 50-50 joint venture planned, which Carlos was talking about. To us, 50-50 stands for win-win. 
but our collaboration goes way beyond economic textbook advantages. I'm convinced in many ways our partnership has become a model for collaboration in the auto industry. We work in project-oriented, diverse teams, driven by the best ideas. May they originate in Paris, Stuttgart, or Yokohama. Sharing competence across continents has been daily business within our teams for seven straight years. And I couldn't think of a better person for sharing this cross-national, cross-company collaboration with then our world citizen, Carlos. So for us, it's the perfect opportunity for a sustainable uh, way going forward. And uh, therefore, I'm very sure that this partnership will continue to be successful and we'll see many more benefits on both sides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Dieter. So now we're going into the Q&A session. Um, just to keep it in the line, just one question, please. Raise your arm. We'll pick you out, and then we would be very kind to say who you are, for whom you're working for. We'll start here in the first row. You get a mic. Wait a second. The mic is there. Go ahead. Paul Eisenstein from a lot of places. <sighs> I wonder if you could talk uh, a bit about something you touched on very early, uh, Carlos. The, the world is changing. Uh, you had a lot of that in your news conference yesterday. And it's not the same sort of industry that we talked about when just when this alliance was formed. So how will the alliance change to deal with, uh, well, to steer your line with uh, uh, case? Uh, connectivity, autonomy, uh, sharing, electronics, and some of the other changes that are coming. I think the same principles apply, which have uh, applied in the more traditional areas uh, we were collaborating with so far. I mean, electrification is one element of this new world, if you want, and there we already, I just was talking about it, uh, have uh, a valid project of collaboration beneficial to both of us. Uh, and when it comes to the other connectivity, autonomous uh, shared elements, it's the same principle. Uh, we both develop a strategy for our companies. Um, we share um, where we could find a touch point and we then investigate if it's beneficial for all partners, two or three, potentially involved to do something together. And when we all say yes, that's, that's a fact, then we go for it. And we say, well, it might be good for you, but not for me, uh, then we don't go for it. Uh, so it's very simple and pragmatic, and therefore I'm pretty sure that we will have um, areas of collaboration in these new fields as mu uh, much as we just started with electrification. Yeah, frankly, nothing to add to it. Uh, very pragmatic, no taboo. We recognize from time to time that there are points of sensitivity from one company to the other. We put it on the table, and uh, we decide to go ahead only when we're both comfortable with it, and we see there is a really good uh, good, good result. So I don't want to say that we do everything. No, uh, it's not uh, realistic. But uh, whenever there is appetite, interrogation, benchmark, necessary exchange, we do it. I don't think you, I, I think the priority is coming from uh, the, the the need of one of the partner and particularly the opportunity it offers. That's all. I don't think we say, oh, that means product is the first priority versus uh, powertrain versus manufacturing together or versus exchanging best practices here and there. Uh, nothing. That means we bring to the table some opportunities. We discuss them. Uh, I, I think the the main priority is how much. Uh, synergies we can get by working uh, together. That's that's probably our priority. And of course, um, economy of scale is one element which drives uh, this benefit. And if you, for instance, talk about autonomous, we are not at the stage where scale would matter. Um, and when we talk about research and early stages of development, it still can make sense to share resources, and then we do it. Uh, but it's a different kind of, of benefit. Okay, we have a question there. Can you stand up, please, so we can see? Uh, hello, I'm Eric Desia from uh, Le Monde. Uh, uh, today, uh, Mr. Gosney, in an interview uh, at Les Echo, you, uh, my colleagues uh, write, you said you could reach the number one position in automotive industry. 
uh, uh, to, to strengthen the, the alliance uh, with Daimler in a capitalistic, capitalistic way would help. So is it a reasonable possibility? Uh, I don't think it's a reasonable possibility because we never talked about this and there is no need for that. Uh, the answer, uh, in fact, what your colleagues have written, somebody asked me the question, with Mitsubishi, you may be crossing 10 million cars sold between Renault Nissan and Mitsubishi this year. And I said yes. Which said, obviously, this means that you guys are not very far from the top. I said yes. Uh, even though being a number one has never been an objective, but I, I must uh, admit that uh, it may become a consequence of a good strategy, good management, and the good development of all the brands. Uh, that's it. Because whenever you cross to 10 million units, uh, you, you are in a very small circle uh, of maybe one or two companies and, and the, the difference is not so significant. Uh, there, is no, uh, there is no race for size. I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. But I think, f at least for the generalist, I'm not talking about people who are mainly making their money in premium uh, because this is not applicable. But for generalists, size is important. It, it matters. But what matters is not so much if you're number one, number two, or number three, is that the size difference between you and whoever is number one is, should be very small. Because if it's very small, that means nobody has an advantage of size on you. If you, they don't have an advantage on size, that means scale is not going to be an advantage, so which means that your relationship with your suppliers, sharing the technologies, you have an upper hand if you know how uh, to split the cost between all the, the players. So yes, we may become uh, number one, even though it's not an objective, but hopefully as a consequence of good strategy, good management, and obviously good products. Next one is Christian Hetzner from Automotive News here. Over there, yes. This one. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I wanted to ask, we, we've become so used over these years to constantly hearing about new projects um, you know the, the pickup trucks, the you know the electric cars, etc. This year, there doesn't seem to be any new project that has been created. So, can you tell me, how, do you have a sense that your management capacities have been stretched too thin, and there's no you know, let's focus on executing on on what we've already agreed upon, or have there been uh, simply no attractive projects over the past year? Uh, where you found uh, a co potential for collaboration? Um, we started this uh, collaboration based on three concrete projects where we saw benefits for both partners. And we always said uh, that the objective is not to do as much as possible together, but to benefit from this partnership the most possible. And uh, in this sense, um, for us from day one, the execution and the um, delivery of the benefits which we were envisaging with these projects was an one priority. And that continues and now we have a portfolio of, I don't know, 13 or 14 or 15 projects um, which is already producing a lot of benefits um, and uh, that certainly uh, is a strong foundation for our partnership. Uh, if it stays with this number, it's perfect. Uh, if there's more expansion, it's fine too but it's not an objective in itself. Yeah, and also we can say, and it's normal, that when you start working together, uh, the low-hanging fruits come easily and very fast, and that's why we were able to move from three to 13 very quickly. Uh, from now on, maybe the number of additional projects may take longer time, not because we are spread too thin, but just because of the law of physics. I mean, you, you took everything which was obvious and now we're going to go for more sophisticated collaboration, which probably take a little bit more time to identify and work on. And once again, when we look at various um, mutual architectures or platforms, we're looking at all the components we are sharing. We're looking at now even running plans together. I mean, this is a scope of collaboration, which is, again, totally um, voluntarily between independent partners who maintain the independence and their unique strategies, I think that is a scope which I never expected in the beginning. Okay, thank you. We have a question here. Here. Uh, here, here, please, here. Uh, yes. 
uh, Francoise Calry from uh, AFP News Agency. I have a question uh, about diesel and uh, the collaboration about uh, Renault and, uh, and uh, Daimler. Uh, to Mr. Gohn first, uh, contrary to what you said in the last days, the inquiry of the Royal Commission is not finished, not completely concluded. And um, actually, Renault's uh, products have been showing uh, to be above the limits by a big margin. And uh, are you open to? Uh, are you ready to open your software uh, softwares to the Commission, to the Inquiry Commission, which is going on with their their studies? And uh, to uh, Mr. Zetschke, uh, are you? Do, don't you feel a bit trapped in the alliance and the collaboration about engines because you're using uh, Renault's engines in your uh, products, and you've been audited by the Royal Commission too? Thanks. Uh, uh, okay, so the, the first thing is, you know, in, in terms of emission, we're, we're mixing a lot of things because you said we are above the rules, but uh, the whole debate is that there is an area where there is no official rules. That's why there is a lot of debate. The rules are very official. These are the uh, rules of homologation, which are not defined by car manufacturers, but defined by European Commission and implemented at every country. The debate is not coming from that. The debate is coming from there is a difference between real emissions in some conditions for certain cars and the emissions at the level of the homologation. This is where the debate is taking place. And we have been advocating at the ACOA, and I, I, I can speak for all the members of the ACOA, please put rules. I mean, so we know exactly what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. I don't think the car industry, it's up to the car industry to say how much emission is acceptable or it's not acceptable. It's up to the uh, only authority which is legitimate for that, which is European Commission or the country to say, you know, this is the level of emission uh, that you guys are allowed to do for this particular technology and we will follow, uh, and we will follow it. And uh, so that's what I want to say. This being said, there is an inquiry going on in France, but in many other countries. Most of the country have said uh, there is no cheating device. It's done for all car manufacturers, not only for Renault. But the debate is, uh, you know, how can we improve the situation in order to reestablish trust, uh, you know, with most of the consumer. And for this, we are ready to collaborate at all the levels, and which, which by the way, we are doing uh, in France and in many other countries, uh, to make sure that there is no confusion about the performance of our engines in the case of the emission of diesel and uh, the discrepancy existing between uh, the homologation of the engine and the so-called uh, real, uh, real condition in certain cases. We have decided to engage by ourselves on some improvements on which we shared with the, with the, with the Commission, but we are in totally determined to collaborate uh, with all the Commission because we think that the trust of our customer is based on that. I am ready to open everything which is necessary to establish the trust. Okay. Next in line is... I should answer perhaps too. Oh, sorry. That's fine. Well, um, I don't feel trapped and we don't feel trapped. Uh, we have um, decided for this collaboration. Uh, we had uh, expectations for the take rate of these entry-level uh, engines uh, in the car lines where they are uh, used. And these expect expectations were uh, wrong. Uh, reality showed that the demand was threefold to our original planning uh, and fortunately um, Renault was able to beef up the supply um, according to this demand so these uh, engines are very successful in the marketplace have been, are and will be um, within the whole process which Carlos was just describing um, we voluntarily agreed as well uh, to improve the software uh, of these uh, engines in question um, to some extent, uh, to the maximum extent possible, and therefore uh, further improve um, the performance of these engines. Our customers at no point of time have ever had any issue with these engines and continue to uh, ask us for more supply. Next in line is Annika Graf from 
Deutsche Presseagentur, DPA. Thank you very much. I have a question for both of you. Um, in the press release, you, uh, it is mentioned that uh, the new the batteries for the new smart are coming from Carmen's. Mr. Tetcher, are you also delivering batteries to the to Renault for the Twingo, as it's the same platform, or where are the batteries for the Twingo coming from? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> the batteries are used. Uh, for the smart uh, because there were a number of uh, electric vehicles already on the Renault Nissan side which led to this leadership position of 350,000 units being delivered and therefore uh, with the relatively s slow market response at that point of time uh, further widening of the portfolio including Twingo uh, was not warranted. That's the simple answer. Yeah, The next question here please. Uh, good morning, Lindsay Chapel from Automotive News. Dr. Zetcher, you said just a second ago that uh, among the new things that the partnership is entertaining will be to look at components together. I wonder if you might elaborate on that a little bit uh, specifically. Uh, do you mean uh, vehicle components beyond uh, batteries and electric motors? Do you mean... Um, for example, just sort of peering into the purchasing operations of uh, Renault-Nissan to see whether there are new components that Daimler might use, or do you in fact mean perhaps Daimler could participate more in the Renault-Nissan purchasing uh, organization? Well, uh, obviously I didn't uh, speak out precisely what I wanted to talk about is the current status. Um, of our collaboration, which includes, and when I said components, I was thinking about engines, transmissions, uh, which are a significant part of our current exchange, um, that there's a possibility to expand that uh, is a fact all the time. And obviously we have um, supplier components as well, uh, which we purchase from the same sources. Uh, and of course, um, the uh, Nissan Infinity vehicle, which was launched more recently, um, is one example for this uh, mutual use of components which are not built by either one of us. But I did not, um, I did not want to talk about anything new uh, which would be planned for the future. Okay, over here, right? Hello, uh, Joachim Oliver, international correspondent. Um, a question for both gentlemen as well. Uh, Daimler's and Renault uh, Nissan customers are by definition different. Um, premium uh, brand, mainstream brands. Uh, now, um, Mercedes-Benz has announced an intention to uh, become a leader in, uh, in the EV market. And the leader in the EV market today is um, Nissan Renault. Could this create some tension between the uh, uh, so far happy um, cooperation? Well, even if that were the correct quote, uh, I would not foresee any tension because we talk, as Carlos just said, even on uh, about things which potentially uh, could be seen differently on both sides, and then we talk about that and come to a conclusion. But what I said, um, and I guess it has been recorded, uh, is that we want to become the leaders in the premium electric um, vehicle field, just uh, as we... Uh, intend to stay a premium car manufacturer uh, and therefore even in this sense there will be not even the beginning of a potential uh, tension or conflict. Okay, we have somebody in the back please. Uh, morning gentlemen, Peter Campbell from the Financial Times. Uh, reasonably easily question I hope. Um, in what year do you expect to sell more electric cars than diesel cars? Easy question, more difficult answer. <laughs> Therefore, I let Carlos start to answer. What, what, what's, what's the horizon of your question? I mean, we can go to up to many years. I mean, frankly, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long time, and it depends market by market. Uh, I think uh, we will sell uh, certainly more electric cars than diesel car in China very soon. Uh, in Europe, it's going to take uh, a little bit more time. We, we both know that we need diesel. Uh, and diesel will be part of the industry no matter what uh, because there is no way we can reach the CO2 uh, emissions level which are required from us in the future. 
on top of the fact that diesel gives a lot of benefit to customers who continue to buy it massively, in, particularly in certain segments of the market. So I, I, I don't think within the next uh, 10 years you can see anything like this happen. Frankly, beyond 10 years, nobody can do any forecast. And anyway, nobody would be probably here to witness uh, the, the answer. But I would say for the next 10 years, uh, this is going to continue to be a very strong factor. Electric cars are going to increase in Europe. But I don't think the lines will be crossing, uh, you know, before this, uh, before this time frame. That's what I would answer. I mean, ultimately, beyond all, all questions of incentives uh, and regulation, um, we are, even though the markets are regulated, uh, working in free markets where the customer has the ultimate decision. And therefore, ultimately, it comes down to the question, is an electric car uh, competitive? And this applies to the performance of this car, and this applies to the cost and thereby price of this car. And when the entire package to a customer for his own purposes, not because he wants to uh, build a better world or whatever, um, seems to be the, be the better choice, we'll see the tipping point. And we are working on that by improving the electric cars all the time, by driving the cost down uh, in order to come to this tipping point. And that is certainly a much better uh, force than trying to regulate and prohibit uh, the one or the other product in any market or city or whatever. Well, I, I mean, uh, to, today China is already the largest car market for electric cars, already. Uh, but uh, w what's selling in China, as you know, are the small and very low-cost EVs. That, that's what practically <coughs> developing, uh, developing a lot. Uh, so the market of EV increasing in Europe, uh, it's booming in China, but we don't know uh, if this is going to continue. We don't know that there are going to be a lot of new products coming, and there is a lot of support from the from the government. So if this support continues, uh, I can tell you, I can see this happening very, very fast. I mean, within the next three to four years. Okay, the gentleman over here. My name is Fernando Valeque de Barros, international correspondent working for Folha de São Paulo today. In some weeks, uh, one of your first products together will uh, appear in Argentina, it's the pickup. Uh, I would like to know why it's possible to make the pickup in Argentina, why the choose for Argentina, what else you are preparing for South America, and what about Mitsubishi in the puzzle of brands that you have in your partnership? Thank you very much. Yeah, what, what, uh, well, maybe I can take this, uh, this question. Why, why we selected Argentina? Uh, first, because obviously we have a capacity available in Argentina, so we didn't need to build a new plant. We have already a plant with capacity available. Second, uh, the suppliers for pickup truck in Argentina exist. As you know, one of our main uh, Japanese competitor has a large production of pickup truck and large export of pickup truck from Argentina which obviously means that the suppliers of the parts are uh, available, uh, so which makes it much easier for us and much quicker uh, uh, to do. Uh, on top of this, because of the situation in Argentina, which has been a lot of boom and bust for the past years, we know that if you want to have a sustainable presence in the Argentinian market, you need an export uh, operation. Uh, you need to have an export operation so you don't find yourself like we found ourselves a few years ago with no currency uh, in order to uh, uh, operate uh, normally. So necessity to export from Argentina, existence of a pickup truck operation, large pickup truck operation from one of our uh, competitors, existence of the suppliers, existing of an available capacity. That's why we decided to go for, uh, for Argentina. And we wanted to be regrouped because obviously this is a common project where on one platform you're going to have uh, Daimler pickup, you're going to have Renault pickup, and you're going to have Nissan uh, pickup in order to benefit from the economy of scale. We follow the exactly the same strategy by exporting vans out of Argentina, so it just makes sense. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's too early. As you know, we are in due diligence with Mitsubishi. The operation has not been closed. When it will be closed, then we, we can talk more about, uh, you know, the opportunities for Mitsubishi. But for the moment, it's, uh, uh, it's not valid. Okay. Uh, the third row, the fourth, the gentleman with the glasses. Yeah. Um, 
Hi, Larry from China Auto Review. Uh, there's a mention in the press release on the uh, premium compact vehicles uh, being soon produced in China. So I'm wondering uh, if you can give a, a timeline and also how it's going to happen, considering you, each of you have uh, a, a Chinese partner, you know, bike and uh, Dongfeng. I don't think we read the same communique, huh? Uh, you, no? Certainly we didn't write it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, obviously there's cooperation in the compact segment, as everybody knows, and the plant uh, in Aquas Calientes is the, the proof point. Um, the, um, both of us are, are active in China, obviously, uh, but that doesn't mean that in China uh, we have to cooperate with compact cars. There, if you want, because of the reasons you were just mentioning. Okay, the gentleman in the back with the bold hair yeah, and the beard. Sorry, it's a bold one. Yeah. Wilfred Eckeldoner from Manager Magazine. I can in feel room. with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you would uh, both of you were talking a lot about uh, you know economies of scale for working together, um, Mr. Setcher. You right now announce that you will build um, or you will have a range of electric cars pretty soon. How much of Renault will actually be in these cars and actually do you develop a platform together for electric cars or not? Um, not at that point of time. Uh, we have not decided of any project of that kind. Um, but as we said, we are in ongoing um, discussions uh, whether there are additional opportunities and these might affect uh, their electrification beyond what we're already doing with SMART, which I was just describing, uh, but there's no decision made at that point. Okay. Um, the lady on the second row, you have a question? Thank you very much. Uh, Karin Finkenzell, um, Paris correspondent of uh, German business magazine Wirtschaftswoche. Uh, Mr. Gunn, I would like to come back to your demand uh, to fix rules when it comes uh, to emissions. There will be quite tough rules by 2020 at least, um, 95 uh, grams. So, and there are uh, quite a few experts who say quite frankly that this will more or less oblige uh, car manufacturers, well, they don't call it cheating, they call it gaming the results because they say you will never be able to reach these results and uh, you would be obliged to game the results also in the interest of the consumer because if you really wanted to uh, reduce emissions like that it would cost the consumer quite a lot of money. So could you maybe make a statement on that? Well, obviously, I, I don't share the opinion of the experts. Um, I don't think there are going to be any gaming of the results because, frankly, when there is a suspicion of gaming, the ultimate loser is the car maker because this destroys the very important ingredient of any car maker to be prosperous is to gain the trust of the, <coughs> us of the user. So that's why I think not only we're asking for rules, but also we are asking for way to measurement which are absolutely undisputable. So there is not this ambience where everybody suspects everything, uh, you know, how did you measure it, are you gaming, are you playing with it? No, and that's why we, have, we, we are having at the level of the ICO a very open discussion with the European uh, Commission showing the consequences of making certain decision versus the other. The, 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 our challenge, and again, we're not demanding, we're wishing, because at the end of the day it's their decision. Uh, our challenge is, is the following one, is obviously we need rules because no car manufacturer can say how much if emission is allowed. Nobody can say that. That means it's only the government to say, I allow this level of emission, uh, or at the level of the, of the European Commission to say, I allow this kind of, uh, of uh, emission. But then when these rules are being put, then the only rule between us is competition. I mean, whenever I mean, we have to obey the rules, but at the same time compete against each other, and which is which is good uh, for the for the consumer because then we can offer different choices. Some people decide to be very strong on emission beyond the rules. Others decided to be more cost effective or price effective. Others decide to have. So that's what makes the market. But I think what you need to know is. 
gaming is against the interest of car makers because at the end of the day we know and we see how much damage any suspicion on the integrity of what has been announced by the car makers can damage uh, the brand and can damage uh, can damage the business so and that's why we're going to have very tough discussion at the level of the european uh, uh, commission to avoid a situation where uh, we have rules which are going to be in a certain way handicapping uh, ultimately the consumer i mean we can be very specific uh, first of all we're talking about various uh, parts of emissions um, all the time about co2 uh, continuously cop 21 in the city and so on uh, is an ongoing uh, mutual objective to reduce the carbon footprint of mankind including the car industry of course um, the more recent discussions circled around NOx um, and uh, they interact but there are different uh, aspects um, and uh, because of part of the um, discussion and confusion of confusion of the customer is produced about uh, by their uh, lack of precise definition in the requirements uh, we were asking for more specific requirement and this is in the final stages of discussion it in the in main part it has been decided and is called WLTP on the one hand and that relates to CO2 and RDE on the other hand we don't have to go into any details which mostly relates to this question of NOx and uh, except for minor final technicalities which are still in the process of definition uh, these are clearly defined uh, and they leave almost no leeway um, of interpretation and that's good that's good for all of us because it uh, stops this uh, question of what is more legal or less legal it's legal or it's illegal it's very simple and that's what we need uh, and uh, therefore um, the, the requirement of 95 CO2 is a firm and very precise requirement and there's no gaming whatsoever whatever analysts or specialists or experts might think uh, and it's a huge huge um, challenge for all of us and it's associated with a lot of additional cost in order to get our CO2 uh, footprint down we have to invest a lot <coughs> including plug-in hybrids for thousands of euros which the customers are not willing or not able or both um, to pay for so yes of course that's a burden uh, on us and it's a burden on the customers to the extent we can price for it uh, but I think we all share this common objective that we want to maintain uh, individual mobility and at the same time we want to reduce the negative elements of mass uh, transportation or uh, mass individual transportation um, by reducing the, the uh, footprint of every single vehicle um, on that path. And it's our job as, as managers to uh, find the best balance uh, in this regard that ultimately customers can and want to buy our products uh, still and on the other hand we make as fast progress as possible on this emission side. So last question now, short question, short answer, Ed Taylor from Reuters. Hi there. Uh, a question about manufacturing. Aguas Calientes will have MFA2 based cars rolling off the production line. I see a line in the press release which suggests there will be manufacturing of MFA2 based cars in China and in Europe. My question is maybe for Mr. Tsecha specifically have your factory upgrades in Hungary, for example, included the possibility of manufacturing infinity cars there as well is that a possibility and a plan or elsewhere for that matter well in general terms uh, with a more and more um, unpredictable future uh, for the world altogether and for our industry as well uh, flexibility is the name of the game uh, talk about uh, the question we discussed before when will be the tipping point between electric cars and, and combustion engine cars? thousand dollar question, nobody can answer. The only thing you can do is to establish a business system, and this certainly applies to your production network uh, in the first place, which is as flexible as ever possible. 
and therefore um, our compact car plans um, apply to these needs and uh, will allow us to produce uh, not only potentially if that were a, a question we would raise um, other um, other bodies or other uh, vehicles on these architectures for other brands, but it will e they will even allow us to produce rear-wheel drive vehicles on the same assembly lines. So that's the kind of flexibility we have to uh, accomplish, and therefore it's not a technical question, it's an economical question. Does it make sense for us to pursue any uh, one of these uh, ideas?